we don't need. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. While you're standing, open your Bibles up with me, please, to read it from the Word of God. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. I only have one verse of Scripture to read. May not hold you long by reading from the Word of God. Try to not hold you no longer than the Lord holds me from preaching from the Word of God. We've had some good church here lately. We had some people come to the altar. Maybe today's nothing different. Amen. Amen. 18 and 14. Genesis 18 and 14 is a question that God is asking Abraham, but he's also asking us the same question. I mean, he's going through some hard times right now. Just be honest with me now. Got two of us, three of us, four of us, all. Oh. See, the more one's honest, the rest of us open up. Amen? And God asked Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? Just let that sink in for just a moment, because we always pop back and say, no, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. We say that, but do we live that? Do we believe that? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will. He didn't say, I might. It might happen. There's a good chance. God said, I will. Amen. How many believe when the Lord makes up his mind to do something, the devils in hell can't stop? It? Amen. Amen. I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. God said, I will, and she shall. But when he says that, it's over with. Amen. Amen. Help pray with me today, Father. I thank you for your wills, and I thank you for your shalls, and most of all, I thank you that nothing that I go through is too hard for you to handle. It's too hard for me to handle. I confess today I can't handle half of life's troubles. Oh, but Lord, your word said, casting all of our cares upon you, not just some of them, but everything that troubles us today, we're going to cast our cares upon you, for we know that you care for us, Lord. And we thank you for being our shepherd. We thank you for being our father. Therefore, we cry, Abba, Father. In the Jewish language, that means daddy, daddy. Or we would say dada as a child, Lord. And we cry out to you. We know it's not Father's Day, but every day is the day that you have made. And help us to rejoice and to be glad in it today. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. And when we leave here, we're filled up, filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with joy, love, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, tempers against such. There is no law. We pray for the abundance of my heart, that my mouth will speak, my heart may be filled with love, and we'll give you all praise and glory. Don't let no one leave this sanctuary lost. They don't have to. There's no need in it. Lord, you came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I pray the Holy Spirit anoint these words that I say, that they may not return it to you, Lord, but it'll accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you sent it. We'll give you all praise for in Jesus. Mighty name we pray. Somebody give the Lord some praise. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I want to title this message, Hard but Not Impossible. The Bible teaches us in Job chapter 14, verse 1. You've heard it quoted many, many times behind the pulpit. Uh, Job 14, 1 says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So that tells me whether you're a godly person or whether you're an ungodly person, your days is few and they're full of trouble. So the Bible also tells us in Psalms 34 and 19 that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. I've had people that come to me and I thought the same thing myself from time to time that ever since I've given my heart to the Lord, it seems like the world has turned upside down. Besides getting better, it seems to get worse and you just cannot come to a conclusion that why things happen when they happen in your life. And you begin to question your salvation and wonder if you're even saved because of what you're going through. But if you're questioning your salvation because of what you're going through, I believe that's a good identity. That's who we are because we're righteous by the blood of Jesus. And if we're righteous, then we're going to go through some stuff. Amen? We're not only going to go through some stuff, we're going to go through a lot of stuff. Praise God. And I come to let you know today that if the devil's not on your tracks, then he's probably already got you hindered. But if he's on your tracks, give God some praise today that you're on the right side. Amen? Just because the devil comes to my house lets me know that I'm okay with the Lord. Just because many of the afflictions of the righteous lets me know that my God's going to see me through every one of them. I might be 
in a fire right now. And you may laugh at me the way I go through the fire, but don't you laugh yet, because I ain't staying in this fire. I'm coming through this fire, because he said he'd never leave me, don't forsake me. And the Bible teaches us that Abraham was 75 years old. We don't understand a whole lot about Abraham, but he's 75 years old when it picks up in, in the book of Genesis. And the Bible said that God appeared unto him in, in, in customs in the, in the Old Testament. There was a very good custom for families to stick together. And I'm not talking about husband and wives and children. I'm talking about the descendants of the, the siblings and their children and to their children and children that are far off. And so it was very custom-like or a practice or a habit that they practiced that people stayed together. They stuck together. And, you know, they had, they had little boxes of land that they called it, and they, 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 they stayed in these places. And all of a sudden, God appeared to Abraham. He said, come and follow me. Just out of the midst of nowhere, the Lord comes and tells Abraham, follow me. And it is, it's like, you know, that Abraham didn't even ask where we're going, Lord. I don't know about y'all, but if somebody comes to my house and says, come on, get in the truck and go with me. First thing, I want to know where we're going and how do you drive? Because if you don't drive right, you get over and let me drive. Just tell us where we're going. Amen. I don't want to be in the passenger seat with somebody that don't know how to drive. <laughs> so you can't say that. Can you sit right beside somebody that drives crazy? Amen. And that's why you always ask when you get a big honey, you want me to drive today? You scared you're not going to make it to church. And so Abraham doesn't, he doesn't question God. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterward receive an inheritance, he obeyed and went out not knowing whether he went. He didn't know where he was going. All he knew is God was calling him. God was beckoning him. And so him and his family took up and left God. I believe that's a point to talk about right there. That, you know, so many people will not fulfill their destiny in life because they're too busy stuck in a box. They won't get out of their comfort zone. When God calls them to a different dimension or a high level in life, they want to stay by mama. They want to stay by daddy. They're too scared to get out of daddy and mama's wings. Come on. But the Lord says, let a man leave his father and mother and cling unto his wife, and they shall be one. Come on. Amen. Amen. And, and so they left their comfort zone. They left the, the comfort of mama and daddy, and they went out on their own. They done their best to follow the Lord. And I'm telling you today, God's looking for some people to get out of the boat. He's looking for somebody to get out of their comfort zone. There's too many people that's trying to follow God with this normal walk. And it's always embarrassing when you get out of your normal walk and you begin to do something supernatural for the Lord. And then you fall flat on your face in front of everybody. And you got all the critics in the boat pointing their finger at you and told you, I knew you shouldn't have got out of that boat. You just thought you heard from the Lord. But let me tell you something. Just because you fall doesn't mean God didn't say get out of the boat. Amen. The Bible said a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. Yes. So Abraham goes on with his journey from the Lord. And I begin to read and, and read over this little message today. And it brought great comfort to my heart. The reason that it brought great comfort to my heart because Abraham was messed up, y'all. Yes. He was messed up. If you go back and look at the life of Abraham, and we're going to get into some of it today, Abraham was not what you call a righteous man, although he may have been imputed righteousness by faith. We're the father, we're the children of our father, Abraham, by faith. And God imputes, how many knows what imputes mean? That means if you don't have enough money in your checking account, you didn't earn it, you didn't work for it, but all of a sudden one day you went to write a check that you thought would bounce, and next thing you know you had some running over because you cut one over. God came by your spiritual bank account and put you in some grace that you didn't deserve. Amen. Put you in some righteousness you didn't have. And so, so Abraham was messed up. And, you know, Abraham did not know the day he went to journey on the, on the Lord's journey. He didn't know he was messed up. I can, I can just picture Abraham right now just because Abraham obeyed the Lord. He probably thought he deserved a cookie. Well, look at me. I'm obeying the Lord. Get a, you know how church people is? Church people will get, get their, 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 their britches in the water if somebody don't pat them on the back. But I done this. Ain't nobody recognized me. Ain't nobody called me and said thank you for nothing. 
And so Abraham's got, probably I would think Abraham's got that mentality, but you know, Abraham doesn't worry about that mentality. He goes on to follow the Lord. And as the Lord begins to lead him, Abraham begins to see the messed upness. And the reason that I said Abraham didn't see he was messed up to start with, there's a point that I wanted to make. Even though Abraham didn't see he was messed up, God sees the end from the beginning. And God knew that Abraham was going to mess up before God ever called him. And God still called him. I'm talking to somebody in the church today. You think now that you're too messed up to do something for the Lord. I can't do it for the Lord. I'm messed up. Honey, I want to let you know God knew you was messed up or he ever called you to do what you've done for the Lord. And I'm here to tell you today, don't you worry about how messed up you are because only God can clean you up. He's our Heavenly Father. He'll change a dirty diaper into clean. Come on, somebody. He'll change a mess into a message. He's here to make us holy. He knew we were messed up. And so many people turn from the church because they mess up. I want to remind you of a man called Simon Peter that cursed and swore with an oath. He didn't know his Lord. He didn't do it one time. He done it three times. And Jesus gave him a chance. And Peter was cocky. Peter thought he was clean. Peter didn't think he was going to do it. Peter told him in the garden the night before, I'll never deny you, Lord. Although everybody else will turn their back on, I won't. How many's ever started off like that? Oh, bless the Lord. You was quick to jump up and testify. Bless the Lord. I'm living for the Lord today. I'll never turn my back on the Lord. Next thing you know, you're the one that's cold and indifferent. You're the one that won't stand up and shout no more. You're the one that won't stand up and give God the praise. You're the one that won't have a testimony. It's amazing how you say what you want to, and then you come out and find out you're the one that does do it. Peter said, I won't never deny you, Lord. I'll go all the way with you. Jesus said, Peter, I know what you're going to do tomorrow. All you know what you're going to do is right now. Isn't that amazing? That's why the book of James tells you that when you see your friend, tell them you're not going to go and do this and do that. He says, tell them if the Lord will that we live, I'll do this and I'll do that. Because you don't know what tomorrow may hold. How many knows we don't have tomorrow? Today is the day of salvation. And so God used messed up people. God used Abraham. God used Peter. What about David who was the adulteress and the murderer? What about Moses that was a murderer? You show me too many people in the Bible that was cleaned up. I don't know, but two, that was Enoch and Elijah. And even Elijah was a suicidal. Come on, somebody. Even Elijah prayed, take my life from me. But God still, you. I come to tell the church today, the devil told you, you ain't worth you losing. You ain't worth using, but the devil is a lie that God can take you and use you for his glory and it don't make no difference what everybody else thinks. So many times we're so out to wondering what everybody else thinks. Got to have everybody else approve. I tell you what approval you need to be looking for is in this book. If it's in this book, you need to line up with it. We're trying to buy you a different Bible that says a different thing so you can line up with different authors. Line up with the author and the finisher of our salvation, which is Jesus Christ. I get off of this generation always trying to change the Word of God. Always trying to water down the Word of God. Let me buy me a different Bible. It can't mean what it means. I tell you today, if the Lord said it, we need to line up by it. Quit trying to justify ourselves. Get our grandmas and our grandpas in and say, well, Grandma child, Grandma never did it. Quit dragging Grandma up. Grandma's gone. Let her rest in peace. You do what the Word of God has to say. Quit being a hero of the Word of God, but be you do it. Of the word. I feel like having church. How many wants to have church with me today? Somebody says it's hard, but it's not impossible. Praise God. And so Abraham journeys. He's I just had to never even that wasn't even in my message today. But I just felt like the Lord wanted to come by and just encourage somebody's heart. Because you look at jobs in the church and jobs are empty. And the bad thing about it is the people who have the jobs in the church are getting old. Come on. Thank God for our elders that will do something in the church. Amen. What about young folks? Where are you at? You'll work hard for that dollar. You don't hardly ever miss a day of work. You'll go to work sick. You get a runny nose and you won't come to church. Come on, somebody. 
Uh huh. It's important to make that money, ain't it? Gotta have that money. If they want me to work on Sunday, I work on Sunday. But bless the Lord, don't talk about a vacation Bible school where I have to bring my children out in the middle of the week. You know, Pastor, they're too tired and they need to do their homework. And I'm too tired. I've been working all day. It's a shame when we work for the world harder than we work for God. You wonder why churches are quit, ministries are failing, doors are being locked. It's not their fault, it's our fault. Yeah. Please stop. He got quiet then, did it? That was a stinger. But oh, that was Hebrews 4 and 12 for the word of God. Oh, it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. If you're not living right here, it'll hit you where you hurts. Come on, somebody. I dare I wouldn't waste my gas to go to a minister that wouldn't tell me what the word said. It's the truth that'll make us free. Amen. Praise God. Have you ever been ashamed of your generation? I'm ashamed of mine. I say that with a broken heart. I'm ashamed of my generation. There's very few people to take a stand for God's word. I'm talking about very few. And I'm going to tell you what, you're going to want God to take a stand for you one day. Amen. And he said, if you be ashamed of him before men, he'll be ashamed of you before the Father and the holy angels. We're all acting like Peter and the disciples that had no Holy Spirit power. They were just anointed by God. Jesus had anointed them to heal the sick. And then when trials and troubles came, they turned their back upon the Lord. They put their tail between their legs and they ran like a coward. That's what this generation is doing. We're standing up for God in church. Come on. Hallelujah. But when it comes to standing up for God in the world, we seem to shy away from God. We love Jesus in church on Sunday, but we don't love Jesus through the week days and the world can see it. We're taking our likes that God's given us and we're putting them under a bushel. We don't want nobody to know we're Christian until we walk in church on Sunday. Work on church on Sunday. We pop in here our Sunday best on. Won't everybody think we all got it figured out? We don't win people on Sunday morning. Come on. We don't win people in church. We win people in the streets. Show me one time God won somebody in the church in the Bible. He went to the highways and the hedges. And compel them to come in. This is just a safe haven when they get there to give their heart to the Lord. This is just a knowledge place and a school place. But we've got to go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. And the Bible said that when Abraham finally obeyed, or when he did obey, he didn't finally obey, he obeyed automatically. But when he obeyed, he did not get a cookie. The Bible said that when he began to go into the promised land that God had told him about, this is not the same promised land of Moses, but nevertheless, he made Abraham some promises. He told Abraham, he said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. That's what he said. He said, I'm going to call you away from mom and daddy. I'm going to call you away from your descendants. And I'm going to make you a man of your own self. I'm going to establish your name. How many knows a good name is better than rubies? Amen. It's always good to have mom and daddy to sign for you. I can remember when daddy signed for me for my vehicle, this, that, and other. But, but there was a fear of his belt and there was a fear of his voice. It always made me pay my bills. Even when I was a drunkard and a, and, a, and a wayward person, and I didn't feel like paying my bills, I knew better than coming up for debt and dead ain't gonna want to pay my bills. And there was a couple times that I had to borrow some because I was really off in the deep end. But there was always this conviction with inside of me that I knew that I better do what I was going to do because Daddy's name was on it, and Daddy might have paid for it one time, but I wasn't gonna meet on a second time. I just felt that conviction. How many's ever had a daddy like that or a mama like that when they said something? You better listen to them. Amen? Amen. I can remember many times that my daddy would tell me, he said, you know, you go off and get yourself in trouble and get locked up, don't call me. I got locked up one night. I had one phone call. I called my dad. That was a waste of phone call. <laughs> he didn't come get me. <laughs> but thankfully he did send somebody to come get me. Praise God. But nevertheless, when a person speaks, and, and here Abraham is, he's going off to get his name established, God's established his name, and we think that the road's going to be smooth, we think that the road's going to be easy, but I come to talk about a hard way of life. When you obey the Lord, things are going to get hard. They're going to get tough. They're going to seem impossible. They may be hard, but they're not impossible. 
possible. Praise God. And the first thing that I want to talk about on his journey into the promised land, that Abraham comes into another city. And when I talk about city, I'm not talking about like he's on a vacation and he stops in at Mobile per se and say, we're just going to spend the night here and rent a room and get us a break. No, 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 no. See, it's not that easy to say that they was just on their vacation and they stopped into this city. These cities back in the Old Testament were like territories. They were like dogs. How many ever seen dogs mark their territory? Shouldn't preach about that, should I? But anyhow, they go around just hiking their hind limbs up, squirting everything around. Come on, somebody. They're not using the bathroom that many times. They're telling everything around them, this is my territory. And if you don't believe they mean by what they say when they mark that little bush, you let another dog come by of the same sex and mess up and step on that territory. Bubba, I don't care if that dog's 100 pounds and the one that marked it ain't but 30 pounds. There's a fight on their hands. And it's the same way with this city that Abraham drives into with his donkey. He pulls into with his family. He's on his journey to serve God. I can see his face right now singing the victory, whistling and praising God, knowing that he's obeying God, knowing that I made a decision to accept the Lord into my heart, knowing that everything's going to be all right. And he pulls into the city. And the next thing you know, the kings of the city begins to give his wife a look. We would say wink at her, whistle at her. <whistles> Y'all know that whistle, don't you? You've heard that. Sounds good when it's coming out of your mouth, but wait till it comes out of somebody else's mouth that's your woman. Uh-oh. You just broke out the gauge, didn't you? <laughs> you had to switch blade tuned up a while. And so Abraham pulls into the city and the king wants his woman. And Abraham is so coward that he don't stand up and pull the switchblade out. He tells a lot of this man, say, you go on the house, she's just my sister. What? He ain't got enough of nerves to stand up and protect his woman. He backs up and let the king have his way with her. He's scared of the territory. He knew he had done crossed somebody else's boundary line and that king had done uh, used the path on the leaf and doesn't mark his territory and he was in somebody else's territory. What happens when God leads you into somebody else's territory and says, look at the land for I'm going to give it to you. It might belong to the devil and his enemy today, but I have laid up treasures from the wicked to give it to the righteous. And you look at the land because it's going to be yours. What happens when what happens when God does that? And the next thing you know, you got this big old king looking to take your woman and whoop you up on top of it. I don't know what you would do about it. But Abraham lies. He said, oh, she ain't my wife. She's just my sister. And he kind of tells a half-truth. If you go back and study the history of his wife, he, she's maybe like a stepsister. So I don't know. But anyhow, how many knows a half-truth is a... Oh, I'm so crazy for you that knowledge. A half-truth is a what? 99% of the truth is the truth, though. That's close enough, right? No. James says it like this, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is a sin. And so Abraham's obeying the Lord, but what now? Abraham's marriages get messed with. How, how can God allow something like this to happen to your marriage when you're serving the Lord? Some of you have been through that. Some of you may be going through it right now. Your marriage is being messed with by the enemy. and But you're trying your dead level best to serve the Lord. Maybe he's trying to take your spouse's help. Maybe he's trying to take your spouse's life. I don't know what the devil will try, but I do know one thing about it. He will do everything he can to make us turn around and quit following the Lord. That's what he's on his mission for. But the Bible says that he that puts his hand to the plow and look back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. How many warriors do I have in the house of the Lord this morning to say, Lord, preacher, it's been hard here lately. You don't have a clue of what I've been going through. Yeah, I, I do. Because just because I get up here in this suit and this tie don't make things easy for me neither. Just because the Lord's called me to be a minister, people think I'm supposed to be Superman. Oh, Brother Brandon, I'm supposed to go through stuff. I'm so thankful it was Abraham. 
I'm so thankful that he was listed the father of many nations and still had flaws. Come on. I'm so thankful that he was supposed to be a leader of a country. That God, how many knows that if you read in your Bible, there's two people that God associated with as a friend? Two people. Two people. You'll never guess who it was. It was Abraham and sinners. Only place in the Bible where God was associated. He said he was a friend to sinners. Ain't that what the Bible says? And in James 2 and 23, if you go back and read that, that's amazing. That caught my attention this morning. Many times I read it, I had never really caught the 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 the, the impact that that scripture, that one scripture has. Because if you go back and read it, James 2 and 23, at the end of the verse, he says that he was a friend of God and that friend of God was capitalized. I don't know how much you know about your Bible. When you see people who's represented as names and titles like that are capitalized, most of the time that represents the Trinity of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And when God begins to call someone capitalized friend of God, that is saying something that God thinks highly of Abraham. But Abraham was messed up, y'all. Abraham was messed Here he is on his first test. He's left his his marriage is in the fire. His marriage is going through crumbles and cracks and creases. And the enemy's doing everything he can to take his wife from him. Wants his wife. Give her here. And all Abraham do is say, go ahead, take her. How can you be a father of many nations, but you won't even fight for your own house? Oh, the Lord's preaching up in this house today. How can you fight for a church but won't fight for your own house? Come on. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? I'm telling you, ever since I've been saved, the devil's been after my family. He's tried to take us out by health. He's tried to take us out by finances. And I don't have a lot to brag of tomorrow, but I can stand firmly and say today, I've been through the fire. I'm still in the fire, but I know a man who can give you a jacket that is fireproof. I'm not Don't even smell like no singed hair, does it? Come on. Ain't that what the, uh, the uh, three Hebrew boys did? Yeah. Got thrown in the fire. The enemy was surely going to get rid of them because they didn't bow down and serve their God and said by the time that the sackbook, the psalter, and the ducemer, and all these instruments begin to sing, if these three boys hadn't bowed their knee to this image that this king has made, I'm going to throw them in the fire. And the Bible said that when all the instruments went off, that the three Hebrew boys took their stand for the Lord. I believe the Lord is looking for somebody today to make up the head to stand in the gap and say although everybody else denies you, I'm going to stand for you because you love me when nobody else would love me. You brought me from a place I couldn't bring my own self out of. And the Bible said that when they threw the three Hebrew boys over into the fire, that, that they went and turned the, turned the temperature up. You know how it is when you're cooking something around the house and you want it done quick. That, that the box said 350, you go up and turn to 410. I'm hungry. That pizza said 410, I'm going to turn to 420. They, they know you're going to have a black pizza. And, and, and so they turned it, they turned the temperature up, I want to say seven times. They turned the fire up. It wasn't even normal for a person to survive in the temperature that was already set. But the enemy wanted these boys. It made the devil so mad when he found three people. This wasn't a whole nation that stood up for the Lord. It was three Hebrew boys. Yeah. See, we're thinking all these big fancy churches that are packed out like sardines. Oh, surely they got the goods. I'm not saying they don't. It's possible for a church to have a lot of people and still believe in the truth. But the majority of them, I'm telling you, because I have church with some of them. I go to funerals with majority of them. And I see the garbage that is being taught behind the pulpits. And I'm telling you, all we can do is do our little pom-poms and say a sinner's prayer. 
and we're on our way to heaven, but when I open up my Bible, it doesn't tell me nothing like that. It tells me straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leads to life, and only few are going there. So it don't take a whole lot. You know what's wrong nowadays? We've got to have a multitude to go with us. Amen. Amen. God's called us to live holy. We'll live holy as long as everybody else lives holy with us. Hey, you'll be my friend. You'll be my, yeah, I'll be your friend. What happens when we have to make holy decisions in our life outside of church? If everybody else makes it, I'll make it along with them. But if they say it ain't cool, then I don't want to be friends with you no more. And I'm so thankful for the scripture that says he is a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Because if you live long enough down here, you'll have people who will turn their backs upon you. They'll portray you. You thought they was your friends so you needed them the most. But Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go on. I wish I had somebody to help me preach today. Praise God. Hard, but not impossible. It is hard. The devil's going to try to take your family. He's going to try to take your spouse. He's going to try to take your finances. He's going to try to take everything. He's going to try to take your sanity. But I'm telling you, you, the only way he can take it is if you let him take it. I'm going to say that one again because you don't believe it. Only way the enemy can take anything from you is if you allow him to take it from you. Oh, I, I, yeah, I don't believe that. Well, believe what you want to believe. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. So you can go over your corner and pout and think he's going to have mercy. Oh, I'm going to pout. He don't care. He's still going to keep stealing and keep killing and keep destroying until you learn how to fight. I know what's wrong. We try to fight with the weapons of carnal weapons. But the Bible said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We need to learn to fight on our knees. Come on. We need to learn to fight with the right weapons, for there's no weapon that's formed against us shall be able to prosper. He didn't say the weapon wouldn't be formed. He didn't say the weapon wouldn't come your way. He just said when it hits you to make sure you got the whole armor of God on. Make sure you got the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteous having your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace of love all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the I wish I had somebody help me preach today hard but not impossible you go you go do a survey right now the people that has walked out and left this church and you ask but you don't understand it's just so hard if it wasn't a hard preaching it was hard for what I went through, and hard here, and hard here. Guess what? Us that are still left and remain, it's still hard for us. Amen. But it's not impossible. The Lord asked Abraham, because Abraham was promised not only a father of many nations, he was promised a child. And Abraham done his best to serve the Lord, but just because he done his best don't mean it was the best. He was promised a child, and Abraham went to talk to the Lord. He's 75 years old. I don't know how many 75-year-old people we got here, but half of you ain't dreaming for a child. You dream, you dreaming trying to get rid of some of them. <laughs> Abraham's 75 years old. This man, this man wants a child. Oh, I want my little baby. I want my little baby boy. <laughs> he didn't want a baby girl. He wanted a baby boy. Amen. You can understand. And the next thing you know, Abraham says, I'm going to just trust the Lord. And he did for a while. There's a lot of people start off trusting the Lord for a while. But when it gets harder and harder, and I don't really think it gets harder. I believe we just get impatient waiting. It's the same hardness as it was when you start off. But it's something, and I'm not giving praise to old Muhammad Ali or whatever his name was. But he did have a good, good tactic when it comes to boxing. Because, I mean, you have all these people packing Las Vegas out and all these boxing rings out. And I mean, thousands and millions of dollars were being spent to see Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali would get in and get his head knocked on for however many rounds it was to the last two rounds. And that dude that had been whooping the boxing gloves the whole match, because he ain't been whooping on Muhammad Ali, just put his head, gloves on his head and protect his head. And the only thing he would do was take a lick from the other person in his gloves. You can't hurt a man by hitting him in his gloves. 
But what Muhammad Ali knew that the defender that was fighting him, they come out with such great zeal and such great uh, enthusiastic to, to beat him because he was a champion that he would just sit back and let him beat on his gloves for a while. But come the last two in, uh, rounds, I don't much, know much about boxing. I'm going to say innings, but I don't guess it'd be innings. The last two rounds of boxing, Muhammad Ali would come out there flowing like a butterfly, swinging like a bee. <laughs> you know the old slave, slogan, slave, whatever you want to call it. And man, he would walk circles around him. Why? Because the person that had been swinging was wore out. And I'm warning the church today, you better watch from getting wore out. Because this road is not going to get easier. It's going to get harder the closer you get to home. And everybody beside you might be making fun of you because you're a slowpoke. They may be blowing on their horns, telling you, get out of my way. I'm in a hurry. I got to make it to heaven. When the Bible said, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I might not be Speedy Gonzalez getting there. I just want to make it. How about y'all? I might not be first place for the first is last and the last is first. I just want to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So what's he do now? He keeps following the Lord. I'm so thankful that when we're too big of a coward to fight for ourselves, we have a Savior to fight for us. Amen. The lady that he denied his own wife, the king called her. <laughs> he saw her, man. She's single, you know. Abraham said, this is my sister. So he called her to his bed chamber, going to do his thing, and all of a sudden the Lord told him, not, not Abraham, the Lord told the king, don't you fool with that woman. That man knew when the Lord talked to him, he better chill out. Don't fool with that woman. That woman's Abraham's wife. And God had made Abraham a promise before Abraham started following. How many remember what it was? He said, I'll bless those that bless you, but I'll also curse them that curse you. And that was a promise that God was taking care of Abraham when Abraham wasn't big and cocky and strong and brave enough to take care of himself, the Lord told that man to don't, don't touch that woman. I wonder if anybody can tell the devil today over your spouse can't touch this. Can't touch it. Because what the Lord has blessed you with he'll see you through with. Amen. It's hard. But it's not impossible. The Bible said Abraham went on and his years got longer and longer and longer. And this man is 99 years old. Sarah, his wife, she don't even have babies no more. She never has had a baby. But she can't have a baby now to scientific knowledge. Because her womb is dead. Hello, her womb's always been dead. And now that Abraham, it's amazing to me because Abraham is still excited about the Lord. Even though God had promised him not only a father of many nations, had promised him a child as well. And now he's 99 years old. Let me tell you what happened before 99 years came. Can I tell you? Good. I'll tell you now. He got tired of waiting on the Lord. Do I got a witness up in this house today? You ever get tired of waiting on the Lord? I'm going to raise my hand. I ain't ashamed to admit it. I get tired of waiting on the Lord. I'm saying, like, Lord, you got all eternity. I'm getting old. You're going to bless me. You need to bless me now because I ain't going to be able to enjoy it when you give it to him. If you don't hurry, give it to him. He don't talk. Hey, I know. I'm different. It didn't happen. Abraham was the same way. I got one in the Bible. So you agree? <laughs> Abraham got tired of waiting on the Lord, so he went and done it his own self. Took Hagar, his bondmaid, had a child by her, named him Ishmael, walking around with his chest pulled. I said, uh-huh, told you my Lord would come through. Oh, don't poke your chest out so fast, big boy. And the Lord ain't done nothing, you done it. And that, that right there speaks to the whole church. You cannot earn salvation. No man, no difference what you've done. 
Not by what you do. It's by what the Lord does through you. It, it still comes through you. It's still justified by works, but not your works. This is God's works through you. And so the Lord told him to cast out this bond child. Made him get rid of Hagar. Told him to get rid of all. Get it out of the house. Because self-righteousness, God bars at. God spews out. The Bible said in the book of Revelation, he'd rather you be hot or he'd rather you be cold because there's too many lukewarm people in the church. You don't know if they're serving God or if they're not. So I've been thought about it. I'm almost persuaded to be a Christian, but I'm not so sure. God said, that makes me sick to my stomach. That's what he said in the book of Revelation. He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth because you make me sick. Won't you make your mind up? Today I'm going to serve God. I'm never turning my back on him. Can I have a witness today? Praise God. And so he told him to get him out. Now he's 99 years old. He's going to try to do it. But he still loves the Lord. Because the Bible picks up in the chapter we in. The Bible said there was three visitors that came. I think it was three, maybe two. I think it was three visitors. That came to his house. And he ran out to meet them, and he found out that they was angels of the Lord. And he told Sarah's wife, he said, run, honey. Boy, this was quicker than McDonald's. I'll tell you, this is quicker than fast food service. He said, hurry up. we got to make these men a meal. He asked the people, he said, would y'all stay with me? If I make y'all a meal, would you stay with me? And the Bible said, he runs in there and gets his wife. He says, make up some of that good food that you know how to cook. We cook him for the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> and so he told his servants who was out in the field, he said, go ahead and get one of them little bitty calves. Praise God. You know how them farmers is. They like to hold back on them little calves. And little calves bring that money. He said, don't worry about the little calves. Get the best calves you can get. Get one of them filet mignons. Come on, don't stop with no ribeye. Make sure you got a filet mignon that'll melt in your mouth, not in your hands. He said, hurry up and skin that joker. I could just see him skinning and getting his skin off of him, getting fixed up. And so he's enthusiastic about the Lord. And when he comes to the Lord, Sarah's in the house. She's, I don't know what she's doing, but she's in the house. Maybe she's continuing to prepare the dinner. And Abraham's got all these people out there working for him while he sits up in there and has a chat with the Lord. These three visitors, and these three visitors will tell Abraham, he says, I don't want to let you know the Lord's still going to give you a child, he promised. About that time, I can see Sarah up in there fixing the banana pudding. <laughs> oh, did I do that? Hmm. That's the Lord he said was out there. Ninety something years old. I got anybody down here for him? Not quite yet. I mean, I got in the 80s. Just one, two. Now, what would y'all feel like, Miss Herman, Miss Tom? The Lord came by and told y'all not y'all gonna have a child. Look at Miss Ellen. <laughs> See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? They ain't quite got the years that Abraham's got. Abraham 99, y'all. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> the Lord said, you're gonna have a child. Say we're going. <laughs> And then cover her mouth. She's like, oh my God, did I just do that in front of God? That's how a lot of people did when I first got saved. You go around the house, like, put that beer up, they're Y'all watch your mouth, they're preaching. What? Don't you think the Lord saw you doing that before I got here? Why are you going to hide it from me? I'm not going to do nothing to you, and the Lord is going to bring wrath on you. Please. And that's what they, you know, Sam's like, <laughs> and you didn't catch it in her mouth. And the Lord speaks through the angels and they said, Tell Sarah, I heard her laughing. <laughs> then she got enough of nerves besides confess, she come out there and call the Lord a liar. I ain't laughing. <laughs> How you gonna tell the Lord you ain't laughed? <laughs> Go back and read. She comes out there and said, No, I, I ain't laughing. Yes, she did. Both of them laughed. Abraham, I don't think Abraham laughed in this sense, but he laughed before when he was getting old. And, and, and God is getting ready to do something in our lives, people. That's what the Lord's telling us today. God's getting ready to do something in our lives. But sometimes his timing, oh, we talked about that in Sunday school class this morning. Somehow, sometimes his timing is not our timing, and we get tired of waiting on his timing because we feel like when the Lord comes by and gives us what we've been desiring, that we won't even have the, the, the age to enjoy what he wants us to have. But 
all the while he's learning to develop relationship with us. And you thought it was all about that land he promised you. And you thought it was all about that job he promised you. You thought it was all about those children he promised you. But the whole while it was just about learning to get to know the Lord and walking with him alone. How I many remembers the the, the the thing that God spoke about the most in Genesis before sin ever happened in the garden. Him and Adam walked together in the garden in the cool of the day. You know that's what the Lord desires for each and every one of us in this building today. He wants to walk with you. What broke what broke that walk? Disobedience. God gave him all the trees in the garden. He died over. Don't eat out of this one, Lord. Don't tell me that. Because what you tell me don't do, that's what I'm going to do. Why is it like that? Hard. It's hard. Hard to fight back temptation, but it's not impossible. Hard to keep your mouth closed, but it's not impossible. Hard not to say this. Hard not to do that, but it's not impossible. According to the time of life, I would think that the Lord's talking about nine months here. Something's going on on the inside of Abraham and, and Sarah's laughing about. There's no way he can do it now. But the Lord said, when I come back in nine months, it will happen. It shall happen. You know what he said? Some of us is crossing our fingers. I'm like, ooh, knock on wood. Knock on wood. I hope the Lord does it for me. Knock on wood. <laughs> what scripture is that? Knock on wood. We didn't knock on some wood. It's right in. Hard headed. Won't receive what the Lord has told us. He said he was going to bless us, didn't he? He said he was going to prosper us, didn't he? He said he was going to take care of us, didn't he? He said he took care of the, the uh, birds, didn't he? You know what he said? They don't sow. The, he took care of the grass. How many cut your grass lately? Yeah. Oh, that was bad. Chris, I had on one more. He said that. You know. Preacher, you know I ain't have time here lately. He better go home tomorrow and cut that grass. <laughs> but the grass is given today and tomorrow casts into the oven. He said, how much more will I put clothes on you? How much more will I feed you? How much more will I take care of you? If I take care of the birds, if I take care of the, the people of the far, I mean the animals of the forest, how much more will I take care of my own children? My God is not a child abuser. Come on, somebody. A child forsaker. He is a father. Praise God. And when we need something, we can come to him. And whatever it is, no matter how hard it is, we have got to believe God can do it. He's going to give you your child. Ain't that what he said? If he said he was going to give you your child, walk through the house claiming scripture. Tell the devil what the book said. You can't fight the devil with your temper. You've got to fight the devil with the word of God. Jesus taught us how to fight the devil. Amen. In my closing today, God gave him the child. But everything you go through, just makes you stronger and stronger and stronger. And some of you thinking, I don't know if I can take you anymore. You don't know how much you can take because you don't know what you got inside of you. When somebody needs something very bad and you're in an accident or something like that, just say you was in an accident and something came and, and, and hurt your baby or got your baby trapped. I can remember mama many times because we got in an accident one time. And even if we didn't get in an accident, we slam on brakes. And the and, uh, first thing mama would do, I can just see mama right now. How many of you got a mama? Put that hand over there. Even if she died, she's going to make sure her baby was all right. Amen. When you have to do it, you can do it. Amen. When that adrenaline gets pumping, you just imagine the big alligator, you know. <laughs> oh, I did not say that. I feel like shaking my tree. But anyhow, let's just go back to, to, to Ray Stevens. Let's just put it that way. Somebody's been laughing before you know it. You know what I'm talking about? Just imagine a squirrel got loose in the church. <laughs> I 
I guarantee you, brother, you wouldn't run as fast as you could. You'd run as fast as you had to to get away from that rascal. <laughs> now, you know nothing like that will never happen here, right? Hard, not impossible. Abraham strong. God gives him a child. The child is just of age to get circumcised, just of age. Little bitty old fella. He's talking, he's walking, but he's not old. And now the Lord says, Give him back. Different Abraham this time, though. Abraham laughed the first time. But when Abraham gets his little boy, he says, come on, let's go. Along the journey, couldn't you see a little boy walking beside him? Knowing that he's still human. Knowing that he's still got doubts and worries and fears and anxieties coming to him and saying, the devil going to get you. The Lord's calling you, baby. But the Lord's calling you, baby. Surely you can't have it. You're never going to get to enjoy me. I told you. Da, 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 da. All these negative thoughts that just rush through your mind. And then all of a sudden, little boy said, Daddy, we got, we got the knives, we got the wood, we got the fire. Where does that about that? Mm. And the words that he spoke was a sign that what he had went through made him stronger. He didn't laugh no more. He said, it'd be all right, boy. The Lord will provide. Got to the mountain, saw the place where the Lord had been said, lead your child on top of this mountain. And there were you slain. He tells his servant that was hauling the donkey and wood and stuff, he says, you stay here. Me and the boy, we're going over younger. But what he said at the end was so profound. He said, but we'll be back. He didn't, I mean, he didn't say, I'll be back with a broken heart saying, well, it was the Lord's will to take my baby. No, he said, we will be back. Yeah. What happened to the mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and daddies that entered into their prayer closet? And began to speak life over their children, their grandchildren. And said, devil, I know that you've tried to take them. But I just want to let you know you've got to go through me first. And in order to go through me, you've got to go through him. For greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. And I'm not fighting this battle alone. I got somebody else fighting with me. Come on. Amen. I tell you why we're not entering into that prayer closet no more. It's too hard. It's just too hard, preacher. I'm just, I'm depressed. Well, be depressed and pray depressed. Come on. We all go through depression. We all feel like we're lost fugitives and pilgrims and strangers on this earth. But we've got to do what we're supposed to do and not what we feel like doing. We need to go into our prayer closet and keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. Elijah kept praying. He said, go see what's happening. We need to believe that when we're praying that God's hearing our prayer he's going to send forth the answer in due season. That little servant came back out and said, Master, I don't see nothing happen. The Bible said he went the second time and he prayed again. He sent the little boy out because he wasn't praying in vain. He believed that the words that he was praying, that his father was listening to him and he knew the circumstances had gotten hard, but he knew the God he served was a God of the impossible who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in the little boy said, Master, Master, I don't see nothing. Third day, he went back and prayed again. Master, Master, I don't see. Fourth day, he went back and prayed again. Master, I don't see. Fifth day, he went and prayed again. Master, I don't see. Sixth day, he went and prayed again. Master, I don't see nothing. But God, stand to your feet this morning. But God, 